So my name is Jamie McAllister. I'm a SharePoint MVP and a Microsoft Certified Trainer and, and a working consultant, I have to say. Actually, I'm a French MVP, so actually maybe I'm a MVP rather than MVP. <laughs> I work for Blue Infinity in uh, Geneva, Switzerland, and that's their website there, bi.com. And my blog is on uh, the-north.com slash SharePoint. I'm going to be putting that up at the end as well so you can, so you can see that. Uh, the reason I publicize my blog is there's a, a few links that I'm going to talk about to other resources on the web during this talk, and I've specifically put an article on the blog, so you don't have to madly scribble it down. You're going to have the chance to uh, look at it on there. And if you're interested in Twitter, my hashtag is uh, jmcallisterch. So what do I do? Well, I'm a senior SharePoint consultant. I tend to do business analysis, solution design, development training, and I like to see myself as a bit of an end user solution advocate. I uh, try to promote that sort of thing in organizations because very often it needs a little bit of promotion, as we'll see. So what are we going to look at today? Well, uh, I'm going to spend some time explaining what I believe end user solutions are. Uh, then we're going to get into the case study. We'll look at the client and the opportunity that they had. Uh, the proposed approaches that we discuss within the organization to end user solutions. Then, of course, well, what happened? We'll look at the good, the bad, and yes, there was ugly as well. Uh, we'll have a look at the lessons learned, and then we'll have a bit of a discussion about whether end user solutions are for you <coughs> and your organization. Uh, and then thinking about the future of end user solutions because there's actually quite a lot happening in this area at the moment. Some of which is great and some of which is of some concern. Okay, so what are end user solutions? Well, my definition is it's something that an end user can do, which means strictly no coding, no scripting, no CSS. This is all going to be done through normal Office tools, perhaps through the normal SharePoint UI, manipulating pages, perhaps adding web parts to pages, sure, but certainly no code. If it's got a semicolon in it, you probably don't want to ask your user to write it. So what's it all about? Well, as I say, page and web part manipulation, and we have these wonderful services within SharePoint uh, which we can use. We have InfoPath, we have Excel, Access, and Performance Point services. I like to think that we're utilizing fairly familiar tools when we put end user solutions together. Now what I find with a lot of clients that I visit is uh, these solutions are already paid for. Believe it or not, uh, they've often splashed out for the enterprise licenses already. They have InfoPath, uh, they have Excel and Access. If you're using the cloud in any way, you may be surprised to know that several of these services, uh, notably Access services, is available in most of the subscriptions. So it really is more widely available than it used to be. If I was doing this session a few months ago, perhaps a year ago, I might have spent some time evangelizing uh, SharePoint Designer because it's a free tool and you know, some special users, certainly not widespread use, but some users may have uh, got some results from it. I have to say with the recent changes to SharePoint Designer in terms of uh, the loss of the preview pane and other things, I mm -hmm. won't be evangelizing. Uh, SharePoint designer at all. I no longer consider that an end user tool in, in, in any way. Okay, so what are end user solutions? Let's ask the question again. Well, it corresponds to the composites part of the uh, SharePoint wheel. I don't know if you've seen this little marketing device on the Microsoft website. Uh, it's changed a little bit actually for SharePoint 2013. We don't have this wheel anymore, so I, I have less stuff to poke fun at. Uh, but I thought I'd keep it in for old time's sake. Uh, there are several other um, sections now that didn't really fit into a wheel. We have composites still and communities, etc. But there's also a developer uh, section of the wheel now, which a lot of the end user solution services uh, tend to sit into. So if you're looking at the Microsoft website and uh, after more information, composites, developer is the sort of area on the Microsoft site you want to look at. One thing I want to say about end user solutions, it's all very well me standing here and saying that uh, they should be allowed. And I know I, I've not even gone into detail exactly what we're going to do with them yet, but 
I have to say, they're not the be-all and end-all. End-user solutions have limits, you see. There are certain things, there are certain requirements that if you try to meet them using only end-user solutions, uh, you're going to hit the wall, or I call it the wall. And the idea behind that is, if you try to push beyond the wall, uh, you're simply not going to be successful. There are going to be cases where uh, only developed solutions are going to meet the full requirements um, that your users have. So I just want to flag that for now. I'm not suggesting this as a solution to all your organization's problems. End user solutions are certainly not for every organization. Um, culturally, for instance, it just may not fit. They're certainly not for every person. Uh, I would never advocate that every person in your organization is empowered to create these mini solutions and do whatever they want. Frankly, a lot of people are uncomfortable with it. I would say perhaps one in 20 people in any given organization uh, tends to be comfortable putting these type of solutions together. They're very much a minority pastime within your organization. But, you know, one person's solution can service 100, 200 people in your organization's daily work. So, you know, this, this is fine. What can these things do? Well, they're very good, as I will demonstrate, for uh, visualization, uh, business intelligence. You can drive a certain amount of automation and business logic using these things, and they're very good for paperless business processes. One of the major wins that people tend to get uh, when they roll their own mini solutions are um, forms, for instance, intelligent forms. What have I seen in organizations for real? Well, I saw, for instance, uh, an example where they had a talent management spreadsheet within a large organization, which they used to record people's uh, skills and their likely career path and, you know, notable uh, pieces of information for their next review, etc. This was endlessly emailed around. This was highly confidential information, by the way, and this was endlessly emailed around to the various people. It would have just taken one slip on the CC field for that uh, to be come public. Really bad solution in its uh, original form, but I saw this, for instance, uh, change to be an InfoPath form, which uh, pulled in the information from the various places. It was held in one place, no longer emailed to different people. It was secure. It was a good solution. I've seen this used for visualizing data. As we'll see a little later, you can get some very nice interactive maps, for instance, using Visio services. Business intelligence, uh, it can be very good for. Legacy content management, I've seen, ah, let's face it, actually some kludges put together to try and fit bad uh, taxonomy onto current solutions. Um, less said about that, the better, actually. And um, some ad hoc solutions, e.g. room bookings. I saw an example where you could see a map of the building and color-coded in there were the conference rooms for the building, so you could see which conference rooms near you were free at a given period in time, which is better than trying to work out where the heck the rooms are in any large organization. Here's an example of a real thing. Uh, an end user put this together uh, in three days using InfoPath 2010. Previously, this was paper-based. Of course, there was a lot of mistakes, and <coughs> the paper got lost, etc. But someone put this together so that they could order just food uh, for meetings. So the cost center was pre-filled. The costs were always correct. There was an audit trail, and you know it didn't get lost. The food tended to arrive because there was an electronic trail that the food uh, had been ordered. You might be getting a sense of this as well. I'm not talking about anything you know, really enterprise-wide when I talk about end-user solutions. We're talking about tactical, small-scale solutions, quick wins, uh, which, if the end-users didn't do them, might never get done at all. So what are the technologies which enable us to do end-user solutions? Um, Let's say InfoPath 2013 allows us to do much richer validation, for instance, the fields on a form. This is a, uh, an example which Microsoft push around. Uh, we can do formatting. As you can see here, this is actually a list form. And yet, look at the color, look at the fact that we have multiple columns for our material. Look at the fact, for instance, that instead of having a drop-down box where I choose the request type, I can 
have picture buttons instead. This sort of, uh, some people call it gamification of the uh, user interface. It's just a lot more friendly, a lot more accessible. People just feel a little more motivated to fill in all the fields uh, when they see this rather than seeing a drab gray form, which is what you see by default. If you have um, form libraries, then you can do repeating sections. So, for instance, if you have an order, uh, you can have several items in the order. We have this great thing called views. You can actually put together mini dialogues really, really easily in InfoPath. So you, if a form had normally 30 fields to fill in, for instance, I might break that into three views and put 10 fields per view on there, and I just have a next button. It works very nicely. And I can actually connect these to web services. I know that doesn't sound very end user friendly, but trust me, uh, we have a data tab within InfoPath. We can choose the information we want. I've seen the student intern do it anyway, so yeah, it's, uh, it's fairly accessible. Access services. Now, access services used to have a bit of a bad name, but I have to say Microsoft are pushing this strongly in 2013 because they've gi given it a major revamp. People used to be concerned about the performance in access services because what we used to do is we would create a basic access database application with forms and reports, etc. There's usually at least one or two uh, access DB mavens in any organization. And it would be published up to SharePoint, and those forms, those tables from the access DB would become lists, and you'd be able to see the forms and the reports and everything up there within SharePoint. But people were always concerned about the performance, uh, etc. I have to say, because of this recent revamp, if you have SharePoint 2013 and you have in the back end SQL Server 2012, and let's face it, if you've got the cloud, you've always got the latest and greatest available to you, then um, now the performance is much better. The information is held in SQL Server in the back end. For non-technical people, what does that mean? It means it's blazing fast compared to the old picture. Uh, I'm also assured by my pals at Microsoft that the forms that are now produced for access services are cloud friendly. So it works if you've got on-premises SharePoint, it works if you've got Office 365. There are a few limitations, but generally you get most of the things from the original Access DB available to your users. You can get very quick results using this, much more than getting a developer in. I mean, it suits certain types of applications more than others, but I've seen it used for little contact databases, for instance, where you want to uh, do some very basic CRM. It's generally available in all Office 365 uh, subscriptions. The only one I've not seen it in was, uh, I think, Kiosk. So if you want to get your hands dirty with this, it's available to you. OK, Excel services. So uh, this is where you can publish an Excel workbook to SharePoint. And generally, uh, it's then visible on screen. Not only is the information on screen, but you can attach charts to it, and you can show the information very nice and graphically. If this was 2010 and before, I would say the data is read-only. You don't have any online editing. This is kind of a model picture now with 2013, because actually, uh, with Office web apps, etc., who really needs Excel or any of the other Office products actually installed on their machine to change Office documents online? We can, we can do that now. Uh, so why do we want to use this? Well, the old reason was that it allowed us to put Excel data online with the formula behind, but the formula were hidden. So if we had any intellectual property in how our data was ca calculated, then no one saw that. I have to say, there are more compelling reasons uh, to use Excel services now. When I was going through the list of features available in SharePoint 2013, I was rather surprised by a few of the things that had been taken away, for instance. Because what I discovered was uh, the chart web part, which I see end users use quite often, is no longer available in SharePoint 2013. And the justification in the documentation was uh, now you're going to use Excel services uh, to produce charts instead. So if you think you're never going to use these services, but you're using SharePoint 2013 in the near future, you might want to 
uh, revise your position. Let's have a look at what we can get out of it. Uh, on the right there is an example of one of the new Excel services charts. So all I've done is I've put a spreadsheet into a library, I've dropped the Excel web part onto a page, and then I've created a um, graph within my Excel spreadsheet, and the web part can just display that. So I've got much richer graphing opportunities than I ever did before, but I have to use Excel services to do it. And over here on the right, uh, on the left, we have um, a Visio diagram which is attached to data. Basically, these two items are showing the same thing. They're both connected to real data underneath the surface, uh, but they're just showing it in different ways. Another example of Excel uh, now is this sort of graph. This is showing census data across three years um, for various U.S. states. Visio Services is one of my favorite services in SharePoint, and it has been since it was first released. You can get really quick results with it. It's very visual appealing. Um, it's, it's actually very useful, but it's also the most overlooked service in SharePoint at the moment, in, in my opinion. Once again, we can publish a Visio diagram to SharePoint. Um, it's bound to data within SharePoint or outside of SharePoint in some other system, if you so wish, because it now works with uh, BCS. You can show near real-time updates as well. It's very good for uh, binding maps to information. For instance, if you had a geographical region and you wanted to show who was meeting their sales targets in that region and who wasn't, Physio Services is really good for that sort of thing. Uh, organization charts, um, maps of buildings, etc. And a little bit off topic, but Physio is also good uh, for sketching together higher level workflows. Now, I have to say, full blown workflows, definitely not an end user solution, but your business analysts in your organization probably understand your business processes enough that they can sketch out um, workflows at a high level using Visio, and then it's possible to hand those off to developers. So let's say that's a hybrid. Uh, and use a solution. What does it look like? Well, this is a real example. If I told you uh, that this was put together in about five minutes, uh, you may think you may be surprised by that. But it's true. This US map is connected to a list which has uh, sales information in it, and the red states are not meeting their sales targets. You can immediately see here that instead of seeing this as some drab list of information, I'm immediately seeing, for instance, that these two states that aren't meeting sales targets are also next to each other. If this was in uh, alphabetical order of states, I, I might never make the connection. But as a business person, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, you know what, maybe the sales team, the mobile sales team in this area, maybe there's a problem there. So I can actually click on the state in question and then just by connecting the web part to a list view web part, I can then bring up the details of the regional manager and get onto them and find out what's going on. So I hope you can see the appeal here to your business and your business users. And as I say, this literally took five minutes to put together with the information already been in place underneath, I might add. Um, if you're interested in doing this yourself, the map is downloadable from the Microsoft website, the US states map. And I have put a video on YouTube about exactly what steps you do in Visio to do this and then put it in SharePoint. So I'll direct you to that article uh, at the end of the talk. Another example, this is the workflow that can be sketched out in uh, Visio. It's very high level, as I say, but your business analysts should be able to do this and then they can hand it off to a development team who will actually put in the proper plumbing and make it work. But once again, this is very just drag and drop. Another thing which is, well, it used to be a bit of an add-on in previous versions of SharePoint, but now it's firmly there uh, within the products is performance point services. And once again, this has been specifically written now in the latest version to be very end-user friendly. 
We have a dashboard designer tool, which you can download from Microsoft, which allows end users to put together their own scorecards, KPIs, filters, dashboards, etc. So this is allowing you to get a high-level view of how certain areas of your business are performing. Let's have a look at that. Here are some examples of what you can do. So for instance, uh, we have filters here, which allow you to see different areas of information, perhaps by department or country or whatever. We have scorecards here, which are giving us a basic visual representation of how certain things are doing. We have this interesting thing here called a strategy map, which actually links together uh, various metrics across your organization uh, to allow you to see how your overall strategy is performing. So this could be several of these tied together in the overall strategy map. How are your world sales doing because of your uh, push in the UK, for instance? And of course, we have the good old classic uh, dashboard with several elements put together. If your organization was used to, for instance, putting together these kind of KPIs, scorecards, etc., this is another of those deprecated features. If you want to, if you have these already and you want to continue doing them, get used to the idea that you're going to be allowing performance point services. Okay, so let's get away from the technology and uh, a quick word about governance because to set the scene for this case study, which I realize I still haven't delivered, um, we need governance in place for any sort of end user solution and I need to uh, make that very clear. If we don't have any governance at all, we can't guarantee the stability of the platform which we actually do business on. Um, we can't guarantee that we'll ever be able to upgrade to a future version of SharePoint. I know there are some organizations that are still on 2001 probably, but you know, generally we, we like to upgrade to the latest stuff if we can. Uh, and we need to make sure that we can support uh, the solutions that we have which are helping us run our business. In my general experience, I've been on projects for a lot of different organizations and the default governance stance is you're not allowed to do anything apart from store documents in document libraries uh, pretty much, regardless of the fact that all the enterprise features have been purchased. Uh, it's often considered easier and safer not to allow anything because, hey, you know, if we only use document libraries, we'll definitely be able to upgrade to the next version, right? Yeah, um, that's all very well, and, and, you know, they're probably right about that, but let's face it, what business value are you getting uh, out of the tool and all the, all the um, features that you've paid for if you don't allow anyone to do anything? This is the governance spectrum as I see it. Now, Anarchy and chaos is the place that we never want to go to within our organization, but usually most organizations I've seen tend to sit somewhere around the total lockdown area of the governance spectrum, I'm afraid. So, you know, once again, you might be able to do a few things. You can probably log on to SharePoint, upload a document to a document library, but as I say, that's, that's usually it. What I would like to see is for us to move into this happy middle ground where we have empowered users who can actually do their jobs without any risk of you know, bringing down the farm or, or generally um, wrecking anything. <coughs> what I find is when governance policies are put together, okay, I mean they tend to be very risk averse and that's fine, but there's usually no cost benefit analysis done. You see, if you disallow all these services um, okay, you know, yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely safer in one sense in that if no one's allowed to do anything, then of course, you know, what harm can ever be wreaked? But of course, it's never seen from the other side. What are the actual benefits here? You see, if my organization was able to see that Visio chart I had before where we were seeing the potential link between the two states with the sales issue there, how much money are we actually losing because we never realized what the problem was there? It's all very well to save costs by not beefing up the servers, say, to allow access services or uh, anything else we like, but what benefits are we missing out on? You see, the business climate in the whole world at the moment is very competitive for everyone, and if we're not getting in there and doing these little tactical solutions and just making things more efficient, how do we know the other folks aren't doing it and getting ahead? You know, so. There is actually risk in not doing anything. 
Now, okay, sometimes maybe the governance policy, you just have to have someone in place to justify some extra resources being brought in so that uh, end users can be trained, end users can be supported uh, for putting solutions together. You know, at the end of the day, SharePoint and all these attendant technologies, it's not accidental that these are, these are actually designed to empower end users from the start. They didn't put Visio services in, you know, uh, by accident because, you know, they were thinking, hey, you know, let, let's just put something else in and pad out the licenses so people will buy them, you know. They actually did it so that people would use these things. And I often feel a little frustrated in, when I see organizations and say, you know, all these things, they actually own them and they're not allowing anyone to use them. You know, these features are paid for. The question we need to ask is, can we afford to not <coughs> allow people to use these features? Because at the end of the day, what are we missing out on? We know the potential risks, but we know the potential risks so we can calculate the costs for them. We can put support in place. We can manage them. What we don't know is what we're missing out on. So that's the thing we need to be careful of. Who really knows what the business needs but the actual end users? You know, they're not the IT folks, they're the people who know how the business runs. So maybe a little bit of trust should be put over for those people. So you're probably asking at this stage, what about that case study? I, I kind of came here for, for a case study. So I guess we should talk about that. A few disclaimers, first of all. This is a personal perspective and shouldn't be seen as a, the perspective of my company. I'm not going to actually name the client involved. Um, so that I can stay out of trouble, you know. Uh, but also it allows me to be as candid as possible because frankly I want to give you a warts and all account uh, of what I've been seeing in organizations and, and especially this one. So let's just say we've got large blue chip organizations in mind. But on SharePoint projects I've probably worked for about 20 organizations in total. So a few anecdotes, lessons might slip in from those other organizations. But, you know, only because it's good stuff, you understand. Okay, so the client is headquartered in Western Europe. They're a very large blue chip. They've got many tens of thousands uh, of employees worldwide, not just within Europe. And they operate in a very competitive business landscape. But they have a very risk-averse information systems culture. So really, you know, this is one of those places where very little is allowed to be done, certainly with SharePoint. They have a global workforce but a highly centralized uh, information systems department. So everything is happening in Western Europe in terms of IT, but people want to use the IT infrastructure right across the globe in many, many different markets. What's the opportunity as I see it? Well, they've already got SharePoint 2010 intranet uh, on-premises, so they really have a good product in place and they've got the freedom to do with it what they want. They can customize it how they like, but they've got this centralized uh, IS department, and let's face it, any IS department is only going to be able to service so many projects a year. They could be re getting requests from all across the globe, and you know, maybe 10, 15 projects will get the tick in the box, funds allocated, and it's all done by the book, and you know, actually it can be quite expensive. But 10, 15 projects in an organization with you know, perhaps 70, 80, 90,000 employees, is that going to meet everyone's needs? Absolutely not. Okay, so the other part of the opportunity from the business side is I found that a lot of the users worldwide are very willing to roll up their sleeves and actually do something. We've got lots of user skills, we've got business knowledge, we've got all this SharePoint potential because they've got enterprise licenses bought already. Now at the end of the day, in such a competitive market, in all these different uh, regions, there's a lot of business advantage potential. If we can get a rapid response in, if we can do tactical and hopefully dis ultimately disposable solutions just to uh, gain advantage, and we're doing that right across the organization, who knows, you know, we could be really cooking on gas. But the problem is, as usual, the the whole thing is locked down. Now, there's not really any policy defined here. The organization just decided when they were putting in SharePoint 2010, let's lock down everything we can think of. Uh, and, and it really was quoted to me as that is the approach. There was no formal governance policy or not something that anyone had ever read. Anyway, who knows what it said. The reason this discussion was had at all is because there was a perception within central information systems department that support costs seem to be escalating. You see, there was a few things that they'd forgotten to lock down. 
And the users right across the world, bless them, were actually, you know, solving their own problems. Now, this, you know, this was causing a bit of a stir in information systems because, you know, occasionally they were getting a phone call saying, well, I've tried to do this in my InfoPath form and, you know, I can't do it. Can you help me out? And, you know, okay, they'd never been involved in the solution, so sure, they were taking up a couple of days to understand the problem. And, you know, there was a worry that this was going on their budget and it was going to look bad. So the discussion began, what are we going to do with end-user solutions at all? Let's put a policy in place. So... The immediate solution from some of the parties in information systems was, let's ban all end-user solutions, because we've, you know, we've discovered these guys are putting together InfoPath forms. Let's, uh, let's just tell them that they're not allowed to anymore and, and remove the option to do it. I was a little bit horrified by this approach as an end-user solution advocate, let's say. But um, so I managed to put a few other ideas on the table. For instance, I I suggested that we put a rapid reaction team in place so that instead of going through the full cycle of budget approved and then you know the analysts get involved and then we go through all these cycles, etc., if it was going to be on an end user solution technology, we could actually work with the users, very small team, very informal, and we could actually roll a lot of these solutions actually with professional developers but using the tools that the end users would generally use. That was one suggestion. Another suggestion was, if they were concerned about support costs, how about we give everyone a ticket of, say, two or three man days and say, look, if your support costs are escalating beyond that for your own solutions, then we have to start charging you after that. We can't be doing two, three weeks support, you know, for these things, because we never know when these support calls are going to be arriving. The other idea was, well, we allow end-user solutions, but we make sure that everyone gets training. Everyone who wants to put in an InfoPath form or one of the other services, they actually get training in it first. Maybe they pass a little internal certification that we've put in, a little online exam, and if they do that, we say, yep, fine. You know, you do end-user solutions, we'll give you support because we know you have a baseline of knowledge. You know what you're doing. And we will have explained the wall, the fact that if you want to do something too ambitious, you're probably not going to be able to do it. And the other one was, do we issue a statement of uh, limitations, support limitations, to say we will support up to this level, but no more. Now, I've just preempted all my slides because I actually broke it down like this. <laughs> okay. So what did I discover during these discussions? Well, I discovered, and I, actually I was quite surprised by this, maybe I shouldn't have been, the barriers to end-user solutions were almost entirely information systems inspired. It was the IT guys who did not want end-user solutions in place in the organization. It was not the business in any way, shape, or form. In fact, in general, the business didn't even know that these features were available at all. And if they were to see something like Visio services, they actually got quite excited and, you know, wanted it. You know. And they were prepared to pay for it. So, you know, what was the problem? Okay, there was some concern about budget, but as I say, it was mostly the support budget. And there was actually quite a lot of dogma. You see, if you talk about access services, and it's true up until 2010, there were concerns about the performance aspects of it. People would be saying, you know, this is going to be very heavy on the servers. You're going to have to buy a couple of extra servers if we want to use it. It might slow things down a little bit otherwise. That might be true. But when I was actually talking to the technical architect, he was saying this to me, but digging under the surface just a little bit. I mean, it sounded like some very well thought out technical architecture had come along, you know. He'd run the numbers. He'd thought, you know, if we did have a thousand users using access services, we would need these extra machines. Not a bit of it. He had heard, you know, as, as we've all probably heard in passing in conversation, access services is a little bit heavy uh, resource-wise. That is all he'd heard, right, banned. No cost-benefit analysis, nothing to say, you know, we're going to get this out of using it, just banned. So dogmatic thinking, a lot of dogmatic thinking for all of these services. There's just this thinking, we can't upgrade if we use them, they're resource heavy, it's going to be a problem, so we're going to have to have extra support costs, so not allowed. So I wasn't necessarily prepared to hear such dogmatic views. I thought, you know, te technological people, you know, they're 
uh, forward thinking, and mm, they're not all, it seems. And there was a lot of vested interests as well. I was rather horrified by one suggestion from a rival consulting company, which said, we should ban all end-user solutions because all requests for solutions should just come to this team. This team being his consultant company's team, so they would get all the business, basically. How's that for putting your client interests before uh, your own? Yeah. Hmm. Okay. I won't name that company. <laughs> Okay, so what did we decide in the end? Which, which one did we go for? Well, after much thought, we decided to go for this one. This doesn't mean this is the one that you would go for in your own organization, but this is what we went for. So we decided we would offer training worldwide to anyone who wanted it. It wasn't necessarily too costly. If the folks are in Indonesia and they need uh, training, uh, quite often I've been in place to deliver it over link. Uh, for instance. So that's the way we played that sort of thing. We put some exams in place using InfoPath forms, actually. And so multiple choice, people can become qualified. And we put out a statement of support limitations to say, look, we're going to support you up to this level, but if it co goes beyond this, then I'm afraid, you know, you're going to have to start finding your own solutions. So... In terms of actual technology, what did they allow in this particular case? Well, InfoPath Designer and the web forms, etc., were fully allowed to all users. Any user in the whole organization can do their own InfoPath form if they so wish. Office integration was fully allowed. MS Access was allowed but generally discouraged. JavaScript, I would never expect an end user to put that together themselves, although you do find occasionally they want a certain action, they want a look and feel, they do go to Google and they do paste in the JavaScript into a content, content editor web part. It's unsupported, but you can do it if you need to do it. What was centrally controlled, therefore non-end user solution? Well, SharePoint Designer was allowed to the development team, Coded Solutions, of course, development team. Visio Access and Excel Services allowed, but only if part of a sanctioned IT project. So it's not like... You know, I, I didn't get my way. I, I would have loved for them to allow Visio services, and, and alas, you don't always get your way, but that's the way it is. So what was the good, the bad, and the ugly in the processes here? Do you think the middle guy should have been the bad or the ugly, by the way? I, I, I didn't know which way to play. I, I hope you agree with my choice, anyway. Okay, so what was good? Well, a lot of users did get prompt tactical solutions to their problems worldwide. How do I know this? I know this because those support requests still come in, so I got some overview of what these guys were doing. I wasn't looking over the shoulder of the guys in the Philippines, for instance, to say, you know, you know what business advantage are you getting, but we were getting calls for them, so I know it was happening. They were getting solutions specific to their needs. They weren't getting IT-derived so solutions which were meant to meet lots of people and therefore were vague for some of the business problems, they were getting what they wanted. So I like to think that opportunities have been seized. Farm safety was met as well because at the end of the day there was nothing in these solutions which, which would endanger the farm. As they say, it was all done through normal office products and no SharePoint designer. And they were utilizing familiar tools which they use on a regular basis anyway quite often. What was the bad? Well, we continued to get support requests, so was that really resolved? Not necessarily, but you know, if an IT department can't give support to users, what is it there for? Uh, the other thing was repeatability. In most cases, these solutions can't be deployed to different places and between environments, so it's mostly the case you put it in one place and that's where it's used. It's developed in place. Uh, the cost, and this is an organizational issue really, the cost was kind of unmeasured. How much time were people spending on this? What was the ultimate benefit? I don't know, because that would have been, um, that would have had to be put in place deliberately right from the start, and the politics in the organization didn't allow that. Um, <coughs> And the other bad was IS continued to provide support for these things, but they didn't get any credit for it. What was the ugly? Well, okay, user intransigence. Now, this is another issue with end user solutions, in my opinion, uh, which we have to watch out for. I often find 
maybe it's a cultural thing in some organisations, but there is often absolutely no willingness whatsoever to compromise on any element of the requirements ever. Yeah? It doesn't seem to matter how much it will cost extra to have this web part on the left of the screen on the right. You know, I've had conversations sometimes who say, if, if we keep this on the right, which is the default, it's a five-minute job, but if you want to have it on the left of the screen, it's going to be five days, and it's, we want it on the left. You know, and I run into this sort of thing all the time. There was a real instance in this organization where <coughs> they wanted some sort of links on one of the pages to be green, and in that end-user solution technology, it couldn't be green, and they actually escalated this right to the top of the organization as like a major issue, this needs to be green, and they ended up spending tens of thousands on some rival system just for the color of the links, literally. Not, it wasn't functional, it was just the way it looked. Okay, fine. Uh, the other thing was some of these solutions are brittle in that if you're doing uh, lookup columns, for instance, or, you know, they're, they're not locked like coded solutions. If I compile something and I release it to the server, then only other developers are gonna be able to change it and break it. Of course, some of these solutions, if anyone can go in and edit the InfoPath form, if, they, if they're a space owner and, and you have several of them, then these solutions can be broken. The other ugly thing is upgrade. Not that um, these are less upgradable than anything, but the thing is, I came to the decision that you can never guarantee upgrade, smooth upgrade of every single thing you do uh, within SharePoint. That's just my personal opinion. But if you look at something like uh, the way SharePoint Designer lost, lost the preview pane, and you've got all these organizations which had put data view web parts and little dashboards in place using that, moving to 2013, they're not going to be able to maintain those in the same way because it's no longer a code-free uh, solution. Can you guarantee that anything will actually upgrade smoothly? No. I don't think you can, actually. You always have to factor in that there's going to be some cost. But you need to just plan for that rather than pushing back and saying, oh, this is going to be an upgrade cost, therefore we can't do it at all. So what were the lessons learned? Well, here are a few lessons learned in no particular order. I'm a technologist, and I like to talk about technology, so I might talk about Visio services in terms of, yeah, and you can bind it to even like text files and, and XML files, and, yeah, okay, picture the user's faces when I'm talking like that. So I, I really had to, you know, stop myself and I say, yeah, look at, look, look, look at the value to the business in, in you know, this, this is a solution to your problems. So I identify the business pain points. I actually talk about these technologies in relation to solving the business pain points. I don't talk about technological features at all. That's one for the other guys who are into that stuff. Cost can often be calculated much more easily than the benefits. It doesn't mean that there aren't any benefits, of course. Now, you may be asked for hard numbers for cost and benefit if you try to justify end-user solutions in your organization. It's not impossible. Difficult doesn't mean impossible. You can put a program in place so that you will measure uh, the benefits more readily. There was a piece by Andrew Woodward, which I... I don't expect you to write down. I've, I've put it in the blog article I mentioned. Uh, so don't, don't madly scribble. You don't have to. Uh, Andrew Woodward put together uh, an article which was interesting about uh, defining measurable outcomes. And I think they even offer some training uh, around this topic. I was talking to one of the MVPs the other day, uh, a very well-known one. Uh, I don't think he's ready to go public on this, but he was telling me he's also been doing some work on defining measurable outcomes, and he's going to be publishing that soon. So when he publishes that, I will also publicize the fact that that is out, because I think that's very important for a lot of organizations. Prepare arguments to common information systems dogma and vested interests. I was a little bit surprised when I ran into some of these viewpoints, which I've already mentioned, such as, Access services is very expensive, therefore we won't allow it. Yeah. So actually, get some numbers in place. If you can get some idea of cost and benefit, etc., up front, then you can actually put some numbers in front of people, for instance, and persuade them, rather than them just having this opinion which they've heard in a forum sometime. Demonstrate something visual. I have to say, I'm more impressed as a, as a solution provider when things actually work properly, but I found the business is generally more impressed when something looks nice. It doesn't actually matter if it works properly. 
Okay, so, you know, visual is good. Swim carefully in politically charged waters. There is a lot of politics involved in this whole topic. Trying to get any organization to do things in a different way is, is difficult, and you have to be careful. And training is a very tough sell in some organizations. I happen to be working for an organization right now where they offer training so casually you wouldn't believe it, but that really is the exception. I have been very surprised in some organizations to say, well, you know, what about if we actually told the users how to use this technology before we just give it to them? Oh, no, we can't do that. Too expensive. You know, it's far better for them to spend three months over a one-week task than give them training. Okay. <laughs> um, have an elevator pitch prepared. And this is the idea. If you get stuck in the lift with the CEO and he says, well, what about all this end-user solution nonsense? You know, what, what's it going to do for me? Well, you know, rather than kind of fumbling through your words, have a 30-second pitch that... Hopefully, you know, is, is accurate and genuine, but, you know, prepare what you're going to say. The other thing, if I haven't made it clear already, there's nothing enterprise-wide about these things. The whole business integrity should not rest on these solutions. We're talking small-scale, we're talking tactical solutions, and hopefully, ultimately, uh, disposable uh, solutions. And the other lesson I learned was if the business wants it, it'll happen. As I say, they'd never seen many of these solutions. And the fact that they had seen them, they, they wanted to keep them. It was kind of almost the case that IT were hiding these capabilities from the business. So are end user solutions suitable for you? You need to ask yourself a few questions. And there are a few sample <coughs> questions here. Are your end users up to it, in your opinion? You know the organization better than I do. Is the company culture against this sort of thing? It may be. Is training and support available? If it isn't, then I suggest you don't go ahead. Is the licensing in place? If it is already, then you know that's one cost you don't have to account for too much. But if you have to buy these licenses specially, well, that's a bit of a tougher sell. Any security concerns, regulatory or compliance issues to do with this? Once again, you'll know your own industry better than I will. If the solution needs to be re replicated in many places for many users, it's probably not an end-user solution. If your IS department are complete stars and they have the resources to roll out everything everyone ever asks for in any given financial year, then great. What do you need end-user solutions for? Hands up who's got an IT department like that. Not a single hand. Yeah, yeah, kind of thought so. Okay, are the costs tracked within the organization? Because if they're not, once again, it's going to be a tough sell ultimately. And at the end of the day, will your business benefit from this? Are you going to get anything out of it? If not, well, don't argue for it. So thinking about the future, if we want to do these things and we want to make sure upgrade can happen, how are we going to smooth the way and allow <laughs> ourselves to do that? Well, there's no sure way, to be honest. Avoiding any sort of coding, any sort of scripting, any sort of custom CSS is the most likely way to success, but frankly, you're never going to be, be able to guarantee it. But you have the best chance if you're doing non-coded solutions in the normal way. Do you have any process in place uh, to hand knowledge over? Um, so if a user puts together a solution and moves into a different team, is anyone going to be able to maintain that afterwards? Make sure that's in place. And can your IS department actually help. As I say, we have this system with Link that we can assist users in other countries. The global com company language is English, therefore I am actually able to assist. If that's not the case in your organization, think about support. Also thinking about the future, th what happened with SharePoint Designer was a very worrying example for me. The fact that the ability for end users to use it in any capacity was completely yanked away. Uh, I was not very happy with that. And there's been a similar situation with InfoPath recently. You may or may not have heard the various rumblings that have been happening since before Christmas, because when InfoPath 2013 was released, we all, well, you know, we excitedly installed it to see what new features we had, and we didn't have any. Apart from the fact it had been reskinned for the new office look, there was nothing new in it. So the rumblings started to say, well, is InfoPath going to die in the near future? Um, and that debate is still going on, to be honest. There has been a post on the Microsoft SharePoint blog, so this is official policy saying InfraPath is 
uh, integrated form solution for SharePoint for the foreseeable future. So it sounds like we're certainly safe for the current wave. But I was at a talk by one of the Microsoft guys about InfoPath uh, yesterday. He was a little less confident about its future than that. At the end of this um, slide, by the at the end of these slides, by the way, I've detailed the other sessions, which. Um, where people will be demonstrating end-user solutions in terms of InfoPath and Visio and other ones in more detail. So you'll be able to go to sessions number one to get more implementation details about how these are done. But also, this guy, I think he was called Darvish, um, you'll, he's, he's the guy from Microsoft, he's the InfoPath specialist. You'll be able to hammer in with your own questions and say, what the heck is happening to uh, InfoPath? Uh, don't tell him I put you up to that, by the way. Okay. <coughs> Okay, so what did we look at? Well, I gave you a long talk about what end-user solutions are, in my opinion. We looked at the client and the opportunity, uh, the proposed approaches to end-user solutions, and what worked out, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I gave you a few lessons learned uh, as I see them, and we talked about whether end-user solutions are for you and your organization, and a few thoughts about the future, which I'm happy to discuss with anyone uh, offline, if you so wish. And... That's it. That's my blog address. So if you want to see the article uh, detailing the links from today, that's going to be in there. So the-north.com slash SharePoint. And these are the other sessions which I think you might find useful if you're interested in end-user solutions and how they're done. And just to see a few more real-world examples of what you can achieve and actually how quickly you can achieve them in some cases. So that's me. Any questions?